the line drawing line. Right. There's another couple. All the way through? Yes. Thank you. Okay, um, we left off, <clears throat> we skipped a lot towards the end, uh, three, yeah, three, three, Touchstone and Audrey say they're going to marry, um, three, four, we have Rosalind and Celia, and you know, I said we would pick up with three five. I think uh, one comment about three four. Um, right hand column on page three nineteen. This is Act three, scene four. Let's see, line. I don't know, twenty four, twenty five, or so. There. Uh, Rosalind and Celia are talking about whether or not Orlando will come. If you remember, uh, Rosaline in the form of Ganymede talks with Orlando and says, I can persuade you not to love Rosaline. He's like, no, you can't. And she's like, no, no, I will. I will pretend to be Rosaline and I will act as Rosaline to you. Shakespeare loves this kind of stuff. So they have Rosaline playing Ganymede, playing Rosaline. Woman playing man, playing woman. Okay? Actually, man playing woman, playing man, playing woman. You have to remember, Shakespeare's day, all the female parts were played by the man and or young boys. Okay? Uh, Rosaline probably not played by a young boy, probably a boy in his... Uh, early mid-teens, okay? So, they start talking, and Celia says that she doesn't think he's really in love with Rosaline. Rosaline says, line 25, not true in love? Yes, when he is in, but I think he is not in. That is, yes, when he loves you, he is in love with you. But when he doesn't love you, he's not in love with you. What's she saying about men? I mean, specifically like Orlando. Washes? Yeah, yeah, that they are in constant. She's kind of throwing back on men what men in the Renaissance said about all women. They are in constant in love. You, you can't trust them, guys. They're just going to cheat on you. He's essentially it, okay? Rosaline, you have heard him swear down right he was. She kind of said, how dare you say that about my Orlando? You heard him say, was, not is. Celia would make a great lawyer. You know, she quibbles on the tenses of, of words. Besides, the oath of a lover is no stronger than the word of a tapster, that is, a barkeep. They are both the confirmer of false reckonings. Possibly, I don't know that there is, I never thought about it before, until literally just now. Possibly another allusion to um, Christopher Marlowe's death. If you remember, back on page 318, this is Act 3, Scene 3, Lines 12 and 13. Strikes a man more dead than a great reckoning in a little room. That's almost universally acknowledged to be an allusion to the death of Christopher Marlowe in a room above a bar in Deptford, just south of London on the south uh, side of the Thames. So she you know, mentions a tapster being the confirmer of false reckonings, and you have great reckoning in a little room. There's a little probably elusive connection there. He attends here in the forest on the Duke, your father. That is, Orlando is attending your father. He is serving your father. I, I met the Duke yesterday and had a bunch of questioning with him. She talked about her father. Notice her father didn't recognize her. He asked me of what parentage I was. I told him of as good as he. <laughs> so he laughed and let me go. Well, let's not talk about fathers when there's such a man as Orlando. Why? Why not talk about fathers when there's a man like Orlando around? Just jump to Midsummer Night's Dream for a moment. 
which we often see in literature when you have male-female relations come up or male-female romantic relationships come up and a father is involved. He becomes that wall. Okay? You know, Tale of Pyramus and Thisbe? The wall is what? It's the wall of uh, Thisbe's father's house. So the wall kind of metaphorically represents her father standing between them and such. Then you also have Aegeus, obviously, okay, who stands between Hermia and her great love, Lysander. So let's not talk about fathers. She's kind of going, no, 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 no. I don't want dad to get between us. Celia. So she says, when there's such a brave man as Orlando, Celia, oh, that's a brave man. Kind of like, I think, because Shakespeare alludes from one play to another. Shakespeare's going to have a line in a much, much, much later play. Many consider it to be his last play, The Tempest, when Miranda comes out and she sees a whole bunch of men. Oh, brave new world that has such men in it. I think, could be totally wrong here, that when Shakespeare does that, he might have this kicking around in the back of his mind. Oh, that's a brave man. Oh, brave new world that has such men in it. Okay? He writes brave verses, speaks brave words, swears brave oaths, breaks them bravely, quite traverse, Athwart the heart of his lover, as a puny tilter that spurs his horse but on one side, breaks his staff like a noble goose, but all's brave that youth mounts and folly guides. Who comes here? So look at your glosses, bottom of the page, beginning with line 38. Brave, fine, excellent. So he writes, fine, excellent verses. No, he doesn't. It's bad verse. So why is she calling it fine and excellent? Well, I think she might mean thematically it's fine and excellent. Why? Because what's the subject of his verse? Rosaline, okay? Swears brave O's, breaks them bravely, etc. Okay? So, Corin comes in. And Corin addresses the two of them, mistress and master and such. And we're going to skip the rest of it. Pick up with 3-5. Silvius and Phoebe come in. Now, who are Silvius and Phoebe? Exactly. Silvius loved, they're, they're um, country people. Country, you know, uh, farm boy, farm girl, essentially. Okay? So Silvius loves Phoebe. Phoebe doesn't have the time of day for Silvius. Sweet Phoebe, do not score me, do not. Phoebe, so we have what? We have Helena and Demetrius reversed. Because that's the exact same relationship. It's just reversed. Helena chases after Demetrius. He doesn't want to do anything with her. Sylvius chases after Phoebe. She doesn't want to have anything to do with him. Say that you love me not, but say not so in bitterness. That is, as long as you say so with a smile on your face, that's all the difference. Okay? So, Rosaline, Celia, Corin come in. I would not be thy executioner. I fly thee, for I would not injure thee. Kind of very similar to what Demetrius says to Helena. You shouldn't be following me in the woods. You're, you're just a maiden. I'm a strong young man. Your modesty, you know, I can take what I want. She's saying, I don't want to hurt you. I don't want to kill you. You tell me there's murder in mine eye. Tis pretty, sure, very probable that eyes that are the frailest and softest things who shut their coward gates on atomies should be called tyrants, <coughs> pitchers, murderers. Now I do frown on thee with all my heart, meaning sincerity. I really don't love you. Go away. Okay. Skip the rest of her speech. Silvius. Oh, dear Phoebe, if ever as that ever may be near, you meet in some fresh cheek the power of fancy, then shall you know the wounds invisible that love's keen arrows make. What's he mean in that little speech? Oh, just wait till you get it. 
just waiting <clears throat> till love's fancy takes hold of you. Fancy there means fantasy. Just wait till you're hit by Cupid. He says, then you'll know the wounds invisible. Shakespeare's Day, I think I've talked about this. Love sickness was a medical diagnosis. If a person walked around, as we talked about the one day, clothes undone, you know, not properly tied and buttoned and all that kind of stuff, hat not on correctly. If they sighed a lot, if they moaned a lot, if they didn't sleep well, if their face always looked kind of pinched or ill at ease, they were often just um, diagnosed as being sick in love. Okay? <clears throat> Phoebe says, yeah, but until then, until I'm hit with love's fantasy, come not down near me. Stay away. It's kind of implying, if I'm hit with love's fantasy, then you can come in or come near me. And when that time comes, afflict me with thy mocks. Then you can mock me. Now, from what from what position or perspective or understanding is she saying this? I, and that's not a good way of putting it. Okay? I, I can't put it in her question. She's ignorant of what she's talking about. She's saying, when I feel those love pangs, then you can come do what? Exactly what I'm doing to you. Does Silvius want to do that? No. Why? Because he loves her. Because he loves her and because he knows how it feels to be the, the recipient of that scorn, that mock. Pity me not, as till that time I shall not pity thee. Pity me not means pity me not then. When I come searching for you, then don't show me any pity. Why? Because I'm not going to show any to you. Rosaline. Now, Rosaline and Silvius have overheard all this. What draws or what makes Rosaline come forward? Because she's about to give us a pretty long speech. She's in love and therefore she sees she has empathy for her. She has empious, em, empathy for Silvius or empious for Silvius. <laughs> okay. And Definitely true. Bjorn's right there. What else? What does she have for Phoebe? Scorn. How dare you? I mean, look what she says. Why, I pray you, who might be your mother that you insult, exult, and all at once over the wretched? Now, the who might be the mother is essentially saying, what well-bred woman? breeds offspring like this. She's kind of saying, you're acting inhuman. What though you have no beauty? Whoa, she just said, you're not that good looking. What she really mean? Okay, I admit, corn's not that hot, but honey, <clears throat> you better take what you can get. That's what she means. Okay. Now remember, Rosaline's supposed to be gorgeous, but she's made up as a man now. Okay. <laughs> By my faith, I see no more in you than without candle may go dark to bed. Ooh, you're so ugly. A man wouldn't even want a candle to take you to bed with him. And just, you know, let's just get in the dark and do what we're going to do. And you go away. Okay. Possibly, possibly, I'm not sure, possibly an allusion to the Cupid and Psyche myth. You know the, how's the myth go, sir? Uh, he was sleeping and Psyche couldn't see him, so she took a candle to see if he was truly ugly or not, but then like the wax stripped on him and she saw him in his true form. She was his wife, okay, and her sisters were jealous of her. And they said, he must really be, because they didn't know it was Cupid. It was an unknown lover. He must be really, really foul and ugly. That's why he won't let you see him. 
his face. And she's like, no, no, no. And they talk her into it, and she lights the candle, sees him, and he's just dropped dead. Of course, you think of all the major hunks in the world, wrap them all in one ball, you know. And she drops the wax on him, and he wakes, and he ditches her, essentially. Okay? So, must you be therefore proud and pitiless? Pitiless? What means this? And now we're told, notice the stage direction embedded in the lines. Why do you look on me? Because now, Phoebe is looking at Ganymede like, how are you to talk to me like that? I don't know you. You're not from around here. I see no more in you than in the ordinary of nature's sail work. Look at your gloss. Sail work. Ready-made products. Not of the best quality. Not distinctive. Off the rack. Not bespoke or tailored. Yeah, you're average. Odds my that's God's for my life. That's an oath. My little life, I think she means to tangle my eyes too. Again, that's a little subtle stage direction. I if I were directing this, Sylvius is coming toward Ganymede. And it's almost like you know, she's starting to go a Wolverine, uh, so to speak, on her. Him, whatever. No faith, proud mistress, hope not after it. Tis not your inky brows, your black silk hair, your blue bugle eye bugle eyeballs. That means she's got these yeah, big bulbous eyes. Okay. So if you're casting Phoebe, excuse me. Yes, Phoebe, she shouldn't be gorgeous. She should be a little plain. Okay. Uh, your bulbous, your bugle eyeballs, nor your cheek of cream that can entain my spirits to your worship. And then she turns on Sylvius and says what? You can do a lot better. Well, where are they? They're out in the wood. Sylvius might be thinking, no, I really can't. You know, there's, there's just, the pickings are slim out here. <laughs> You are a thousand times a properer man than she a woman. Tis such fools as you that makes the world full of ill-favored children. So, Rosaline, a.k.a. Ganymede, kind of tells Sylvius he's what? She's plain. You? You're a proper man. <laughs> You're not so bad there, buddy. If you... Mate with her, you will produce what? An ugly child. An ugly child. Ill-favored children. Assuming we get to the sonnets, we're going to see the speaker of the sonnets say, go have children. Why? Because you are drop-dead gorgeous. And you ought to produce more people that look like you. They begin, from fairest creatures we desire increase. Fairest, beautifulest. From the most beautiful creatures, we want increase, right? You see two, pardon my, my imagery, you see two ugly, misshapen people walking down the street, hand in hand, you know, ear up here, nose down here, breast down here, etc. You go, no, God, no, please don't let them procreate. Let them be sterile. Why? Because they're going to mess up the gene pool, okay? That's the idea here. Tis not her glass, but you... That flatters her. Her glass, her mirror. Her mirror doesn't flatter her. What's the mirror do? Yeah. <laughs> Why? Beauty is where? It's in the eye of the beholder. I mean, we saw that passage in, in a Midsummer Night's Dream where we're told, you know, it does what? The eye of the beholder glosses over. We hear Theseus say, it sees what? Helen's beauty in a brow of Egypt. A brow of Egypt in Shakespeare's day was considered ugly. Not just not beautiful. Ugly. Okay? Dark skin was ugly. And out of you, she sees herself more proper than any of her lineaments can show her. That is, in your continually following after, and praising her beauty does what to her? Boasts her ego. It boasts her ego. It makes her think she's more beautiful than she really is. 
But mistress, know yourself. Oracle at Delphi, ancient Greece, had inscribed on a stone two words, know thyself. So anybody who went to ask a question of the oracle, that was kind of the first thing to do. Know who you are. Okay. Oedipus goes, what's he told? You are fated to kill your father, sleep with your mother, and bring to light children from your mother. That is, your children will be your brothers and sisters, etc. Okay. Socrates went to the same oracle, and the oracle told him, you are the wisest man in the world. He said, get out of here. And so he went around asking questions to prove he wasn't the wisest man in the world. And in doing so, proved he was. Why? Because he knew he wasn't. Know yourself. That's an idea or theme that runs through an awful lot of Shakespeare's plays. Know yourself. Down on your knees, thank heaven, fasting for a good man's love. This is a good man. He loved you. <laughs> you should be thanking God. For I must tell you, friendly in your ear, sell when you can. Sell when you are not for all markets. Yeah, you are not for all markets. That is, I mean, this is this is stock market kind of language. You got a buyer. You better sell. Why? Again, the sonnets imply. Or let me use one. It's Robert Harris. To the virgins. To make much of time. It's a carpe diem poem. He essentially says, go while you may marry. Why? Because once past your prime, you may forever tarry. Past your prime, past your youth, past your beauty. If you don't sell then, if you don't use your beauty then, You'll be waiting forever. One dirty, you know, kind of dirty reading of the poem is merely, if you don't have sex while you're young and attractive, you're never going to have sex ever. Because in your 50s or 60s, some guy's going to go, eh, you know. So this is a woman dressed as a man advising another woman this. You are not for all markets. Cry the man mercy. Love him. Take his offer. Phoebe, sweet youth, I pray you chide a year together. I had rather hear you chide than this man woo. What has just happened? Love's fantasy. Bing! Right between the eyes. And Phoebe, she falls in love with Ganymede. Why? If Ganymede said anything, like Demetrius says to Helena, has Ganymede said anything to her to lead her on to say, hey, you know, you have a chance with me, baby. <clears throat> Sell while you can? I don't think so. So why is she suddenly attracted to him? Cool love, excuse me, love apprehends that which cool reason can never comprehend. It reaches for, but cool reason says what? Can't understand it, and reaching way higher than you can grasp. Okay? You all know couples like this, maybe. Well, maybe you yeah. haven't. I've known couples like this, where you look at one half of the couple and the other half of the couple, and you go, how in the world did those two ever get together? How did he ever get her? Or how did she ever get him? Okay. But Phoebe's like, she's, she's now hit. Rosalind, to Phoebe, he's fallen in love with your foulness. To Silvius, and she'll fall in love with my anger. Okay. Why do you look so upon me now? Or why do you look so upon me? That is, now earlier she said, why do you look on me? Now, 
Why do you look place? <clears throat> yeah, so upon me. I think the so implies there's a different way in how Phoebe is now looking at her. And Rosaline's kind of like, I know that look. <laughs> do not fall in love with me. I am faster than vows made in wine. Falser, excuse me. Falser than vows made in wine. How so? Not a man. <laughs> not a man. <laughs> Besides, I like you not. Yeah, well, she likes not Silvius, and yet Silvius is in love with her. Huh. If you'll know my house, tis, and so she tells Silvius, tis at the tuft of all is here hard by, will you go, sister shepherd, ply her hard. Okay, ply. Is there a gloss down there? Yeah, woo her energetically. Ply also means push together. Push together. Okay, her hard. Come, sister, shepherdess, look on him better. Be not proud. Though all the world could see, none could be so abused in sight as he. They leave. Dead shepherd, now I find thy saw of my two ever love that loved not at first sight. Okay. Dead shepherd. Old poet. Whoever said that? You were right. Sylvia, sweet Phoebe. And they go back and forth. Okay, so Sylvia says, line 99, so holy and so perfect is my love, and I in such a poverty of grace. Poverty, poorness, lack. So, my love is holy and perfect. Holy implies it's chaste, it's honorable, I don't want to just roll in the hay, and I am poor of grace, that is, what grace? Is this theological grace? Is this God's grace? Possibly. I once had a professor that said, if something can be elusive of something else, it is. That is, every illusion alludes to everything else kind of a thing. Yeah, I'm not quite sure about that. But because it's related in language of holiness, yeah, that might be there. But what other grace? Her grace. Because what's grace? Favor, gifts. Well, he's poor in her favor, right? Because she's not showing him any. He's poor in her gifts, right? Because she's not giving him any. So, he goes on. That I shall think it a most plenteous crop to glean the broken ears after the man that the main harvest reaps. If I can get what falls from the table that Ganymede is getting from Phoebe, I'll be a happy man. So if she smiles now because of Ganymede, I'll, I'll kind of take those smiles. I'll take that as my smiles. What was it Helena said to Demetrius? I'll be your spaniel. And the woman of where? The woman of Tyre says to Christ when she talks about, you know, her child is sick. And he says, I've not come to foreigners. I've come to the children of Israel. Yea, Lord, but even the dogs eat what falls from the table. He's like, Jesus. I've never seen such, you know, faith in all of Israel. Your child is healed. Okay. To glean the broken ears after the man that the main harvest reaps. Loose now and then a scattered smile. And I'll live upon that. Smile every once in a while. All right. So, for one, Rosalind, Celia, Jaquies enter it. Now, what's Jaquies' character again? Notice Jaquies doesn't get anybody at the end. King, uh, the Duke doesn't get any, you know, he doesn't get a magical wife appear, etc. Just these four romantic couples. Jaquies comes in. I pray thee, pretty youth, let me be better acquainted with thee. They say you are a melancholy fowl. I am so. I do love it better than laughing. He loves melancholy. I don't know if you've known anybody like this. I used to be quite a bit like this. What's it mean? He revels in sadness. Not sadness 
oh, people are dying all over. He revels in the feeling of melancholy. We have a phrase. He throws a pity party. You know, there's music that can bring on this kind of spirit. Shakespeare's going to talk about it in the songs. When to the sessions of sweet, silent thought, I think on thee. Well, those sessions of sweet, silent thought is kind of, you know, when I sit down and I consider and I look at the past and I think of the, essentially, the bad things, the speaker kind of revels in it. Okay? So, I love it more than laughing. Rosaline. Those that are in extremity of either, either what? Laughing and melancholy. Laughing, melancholy. Notice, those that are in extremity are what? Abominable fellows and betray themselves to every modern censure worse than drunkards. So if they are abominable and they are deserving, that's what it means by betraying, of every modern censure worse than drunkards, what's her point? Aim for moderation. That is, a little melancholy is natural at times, right? A little laughter is natural at times. When is laughter inappropriate? That should be sad. Yeah, when you find out somebody's died. You don't stand up to deliver a eulogy and just burst, you know, run into a whole bunch of jokes. Okay? Similarly, a child is born, you don't go in and go, He's going to die. <laughs> Seventy years, but he's going to die. You know, you know. I get accused by students every now and then of being a little morbid because I always, you know, use images of you don't know what's out that door. There could be a murderer. There could be a crazy college student getting ready to kill people. Why? Because it happens every freaking year. We don't know what's going to happen next. So, Jaquez, tis good to be sad and say nothing. That is, just because you're melancholy doesn't mean you have to walk around like Eeyore and make everybody else, you know, feel sad. Why then, tis good to be a post. What? Well, what's a post do? Nothing. It stands there. Okay. Rosaline is saying, if you're human... You got to do something. I have neither the scholar's melancholy, which is emulation, that is, I pretend following somebody else, nor the musicians, musicians, which is fantastical. Why is it fantastical? Where does the musician get the music from? How did Beethoven, who was deaf at the time, come up with bum 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 bum? He couldn't even hear those tones. In his mind. I mean, he probably had them in his mind from when he could hear. But he couldn't, you know, if he sat down at the piano, he couldn't hear them. Actually. Nor the courtiers, which is proud, nor the soldiers, which is ambitious, nor the lawyers, which is politic, nor the ladies, which is nice. <clears throat> Fastidious is what nice there means. Nor the lovers, which is all of these. So the lover's melancholy is emulation, fantastical, proud, ambitious, politic, and nice. It is a melancholy of mine own. He's kind of saying, I'm unique. I'm an original. Compounded of many simples. Simples are medicinal herbs. <coughs> extracted from many objects. Extracted there probably means more like distilled, like perfume is distilled from flowers. And indeed, the sundry contemplation of my travels, in which my often rumination wraps me in a most humorous sadness. Humorous there doesn't mean like we mean humorous. He means full of the humor of sadness, the internal complexion. He's saying, all of my experience teaches me what? 
sadness. A traveler. Well, there's your problem. By my faith, you have great reason to be sad. I fear you have sold your own lands to see other men's. Then to have seen much and to have nothing is to have rich eyes and poor hands. You sold what you had to do what? To go off and see the world. Well, what happens when you come back? You have no place to live. That's stupid. Jaquiz, yes, I have gained my experience. Okay, Orlando comes in. Why? Because he promised that he would. But he's late. So, line 37. Rosaline says, Why, how now, Orlando? Where have you been all this while? You're late. You said you were a lover. You said you would meet me at such and such a time. You, a lover? And you served me such another trick, never come in my sight more? My fair, Okay, he's playing the game. He doesn't know she's really Rosaline. My fair Rosaline, I come within an... I'm only an hour late. Break an hour's promise in love? I mean, if you're really in love, You'd be there when? Right. Early. You, you wouldn't even be there on the dot, you know. Break an hour's promise in love. He that will divide a minute into a thousand parts and break but a part of the thousandth of a minute in the affairs of... Okay, now notice that math. He that would divide a minute into a thousand portions and then break a part of the thousandth in the affairs of love when it has to do with love... It may be said of him that Cupid hath clapped him on the shoulder, but I'll warrant him heart whole. Some will say Cupid's tapped him on the shoulder. But she says, nope, I think his heart is whole. That is, he's untouched. Why is the heart whole? How do we depict on Valentine's love? And then what? The arrow, right? What's the arrow always do? It pierces. And in one sense, it divides. Because part of the heart obviously still stays with the person. And the other part, it's, it now belongs to the other person. It belongs to the beloved. Which, you know, why you get country music. She stole my heart and stomped that sucker flat, you know, etc., etc. And as Shakespeare will see in some of the songs. Pardon me. Nay, and you be so tardy, come no more in my sight. Didn't Phoebe just say that to Silvius? Except for the nay, you're so tardy. She did say, come no more in my sight. I don't pity you, and I won't pity you. I had as leaf be wooed of a snail. I would like to be courted by a snail. And he's like, what? Explain. Oh, I have a snail, for though he comes slowly, he carries his house on his head. A better jointure, I think, than you make a woman. A better jointure, that is, the snail and its shell are of one thing. You're not going to make a good one thing, male, female joining together with a woman. Why? Because you don't pay any attention to time. Besides, he brings his... What? What do you mean he brings his destiny with him? Horns. Why, such as you are fain to be holden, be beholden to your wives for. These are the kukul's horns. Medieval idea that Man and woman get married. The woman goes and fools around with somebody else, and the guy sprouts horns. Not literal horns, metaphorical horns. He's been cuckolded. Okay? Shakespeare here and in other places alludes to this tradition an awful lot. That, men, just be aware. You walk up that altar, really by the time you leave it, those horns are already on your head. The cheating is that fast, okay? So, Orlando says, um, 
Virtue is I, yeah, I'm going to. Virtue is no horn maker. And my Rosaline is virtuous. She couldn't do that. She is, notice she's essentially saying she is virtue embodied. And I am your Rosaline. Plain, but I really am. He doesn't know that. When this is performed, audiences just love this part. Because the audience, notice, is totally in on the dramatic irony that's going on. The characters on stage, other than Rosaline and Celia, are totally unaware of it. So the audience is laughing, and every now and then I've seen productions where Orlando looks up out at the audience like, what are you laughing at? What's so funny out there? Okay. And I am your Rosaline. It pleases him to call you so, but he hath the Rosaline of a better leer than you. Line 63, leer, appearance, color. That is, pretending, but could really show you a truer Rosaline, too. Come, woo me, woo me, for now I am in a holiday humor and like enough to consent. In other words, if you were to ask me right now, I'd say yes. As Rosaline 1 or Rosaline 2, the real one or the false one. What would you say me now, to me now, in if I were your very, very Rosaline? I, I would kiss before I spoke. No, 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 you better speak first. And when you were graveled for lack of matter, you might take occasion to kiss. Graveled, stuck, run aground. That is, when you ran out of words to say, then you might take occasion to kiss. Very good orators, when they are out, they will spit, and for lovers liking, God warned us, the cleanliest shift is to kiss. That is, when you run out of words, just kiss. I don't know what the Me Too movement would do with that today, but dangerous stuff. How if the kiss, well, there we go. How if the kiss be denied? Then she puts you to entreaty, and there that is, then you beg. Then you beg. And there begins a new matter. Orlando, who could be out being before his beloved mistress? Who could be out? That is, who could be separated? Who could be put out by? Who could be dejected if he's before his very mistress, the one he loves? You would be, if I were your mistress, or I should think my honesty ranker what of my suit, that is, what of what of the thing I am appealing for? Not a not out of your apparel, that is, she takes suit by its other meaning, the clothing, and yet out of your suit. The appeal, what it is you want. Notice, by the way, the the double entendre or the little dirty meaning of out of your clothes? Mm, I take some joy to say, am not I your Rosalind? I take some joy to say you are because I would be talking of her. I wish to be. I desire to be. Well, in her person, I say, I, I for her, on her behalf, I don't want you. Then in mine own person, I die. If you say that on her behalf, if you say that with her blessing, then I will die. No, Faye, die by attorney. What does that mean, die by attorney? Die by proxy. Why? Because, oh, this is great, I just had it in my mind. Power of attorney. Right? If you know somebody who's very ill, uh, terminal, they're on their deathbed, et cetera, et cetera, or maybe, you know, you've got somebody family members setting up a will. Often what they do is they, they'll talk about, you know, kind of end of life questions and say, if X, Y, Z happens, then so-and-so has power of attorney. What's that mean? He or she can make life or death decisions. Or he or she can make financial decisions on my behalf. So she says, no, 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 die by attorney. Have somebody else do it for you. This poor world is almost 6,000 years old. He literally thought 
that Shakespeare's day. And in all this time, there was not any man died in his own person, Vitalissa, in a love cause. No man has ever truly in himself died for love. No one, she sang. Troilus had his brains dashed out with a Grecian club, yet he did what he could to die before. He's one of the patterns of love. Troilus and Cressida, Shakespeare writes a play, Troilus and Cressida. Okay. Who else? Hero, Leander. Christopher Marlowe wrote about Hero and Leander. Leander, he would have lived many a fair year, though Hero had turned none, if it had not been for a hot midsummer night. Why? Because he jumped into the Hellespont off the Bosporus, tried to swim across, died. For good youth, he went, but, etc. What else? But these are all lies. These are stories of lovers, and stories are lies. They're not true. Men have died from time to time, and worms have eaten them. I would not have my right Rosaline of this mind, for I protest her frown might kill me. By this hand, it will not kill a fly. That is, this hand, this hand Rosaline's hand won't kill a fly, meaning I'm not going to kill you. But come now, I will be your Rosaline in a more coming on disposition, a more coming on, a more agreeable. Okay, so I'll pretend I'm going to be more agreeable as your Rosaline. So, tell me what you want. I will grant it. Now, what can, what can that mean? If you ask me for a kiss, I will give it. But this is Ganymede the youth pretending to be Rosaline. He says, then love me, Rosaline. Faith will I, Fridays, Saturdays, and all. Wilt thou have me? Aye, twenty such. Have. That implies sexually. How do I know? In twenty such. I'll have you and you. She's pretending to be Rosaline, female. I'll have you and you and you and you and you. And you guys don't have to do all of And go find another 14, 15 more. I'll, I'll have them all. What says... No, no, if you are my Rosaline, you'll what? You'll only have me. Rosaline, are you not good? I hope so. I, I hope I'm good. Now, that could go back to the sex thing also. I, you'd have to show me, you know, you'd have to tell me. Why then can one desire too much of a good thing? If something is a good, then what? You want more of that good, right? So she's saying, she slash he slash she is, take that back, he slash she slash he slash she is saying, if men are good, bring them on. The more men, the better. Come, sister, you shall be the priest. Celia, get over here. Give me your hand, Orlando. What do you say, sister? He says, marry us, Orlando says. I, I cannot say the words. You must begin, will you, Orlando? I'll walk you through it. Go, go to, will you, Orlando, have to wife this Rosaline? I will. But when? When will you have this Rosaline to wife? As soon as she marries us. Now, the to wife means two different things. As soon as we finish this ceremony... She will be my wife. But have my wife also means celebrate, that is, what's the word? Consummate the marriage. Thank you. Brain's not working well. So, as fast as she can marry us, then you must say, I take thee, Rosaline, for wife. I take thee, Rosaline, for wife. I might ask you for your commission, but I do take thee, Orlando, for my husband. There's a girl goes before the priest, and certainly a woman's thought runs before her actions. A woman's thought. She thinks before she acts. So do all thoughts. They are winged. Right? All actions occur when? 
after a thought. The thought might not be much. And the thought might, you know, it might attempt to bury that thought. So, Rosalind, now tell me how long you would have her after you have possessed her. Have there, probably not meaning sexually, but probably meaning as wife, forever and a day. Forever and a day. Notice, not till death do we part. Or not, as Shakespeare puts in Sonnet 116, to the end of doom, or till doomsday. He says, for all eternity. From this point, forevermore. No, no, say a day without the ever. Wow. A day, 24 hours. No, no, Orlando, men are April. When they woo, December when they wed. Maids are May when they are maids, but the sky changes when they are wives. Why does the sky change? They're May when they are wed. They're young, they're pretty, they're in their fresh bloom, so to speak. But then when they're wives, notice it's not a season anymore. It's the sky has changed. I will be more jealous of thee than a Barbary cock pigeon over his hen, more clamorous than a parrot against rain, more newfangled than an ape, more giddy my desires than a monkey. That is, I'm going to obsess over you. I will weep for nothing, and I will do that when you are disposed to be merry. I will laugh like a hyena, and that when thou art inclined to sleep. When we are married, Rosaline says, she'll become what? Not like I am now. <clears throat> Why? Why change? Well, one of the things that oops, one of the things that she's suggesting is part of the fun of the relationship is where it's in the chase, it's in the hunt. Shakespeare says in, in one of the sonnets, I can't remember which one, it's the one about lust. He says, lust is action in chase. Okay, But once achieved, once that lust is performed, it's like a nightmare. It's like looking back and going, that's all? That's what it was? It's no good. It, does, it didn't match the dream. Right? So, they continue talking, and Orlando says, in response to her comments, but will my Rosaline do so? Will my Rosaline, my real one, not you, you're the false one, will she really do what you're saying? <laughs> By my life, she will do as I do. And he doesn't get that, but the audience just erupts in laughter when they hear it. Okay? So they keep talking. 168. For these two hours, Rosaline, I will leave thee. I cannot like thee two hours. I, I, I must attend the Duke at dinner. By two o'clock, I will be with thee again. Go your ways, go your ways. I knew what you would prove. You're like all other men. My friends told me as much, and I thought no less. That flattering tongue of yours won me. You spoke well. Tis but one cast away, and so come death. I mean, a little what here? A little melodramatic? Mm -hmm. She's saying, we spent an hour together, and now pff, you're gone. Two o'clock, right? You'll, you'll be here at two o'clock. I, by my troth and in good earnest, and so God mend me, that is, God kind of make me correct, and by all pretty oaths that are not dangerous, if you break one jot of your promise or one minute behind your hour, I will think you the most pathetical break promise. Now this is Rosaline, Rosaline speaking. It's both Rosalines. In the most hollow lover and the most unworthy of her you call Rosaline that may be chosen out of the gross band of the unfaithful. Keep your promise. He says, oh, no, don't worry. 
with no less religion than if thou wert indeed my Rosaline. Kind of equating her there with God. All right? They leave. Excuse me, Orlando leaves. So we have Celia and Rosaline. And look at what Celia tells her. You have simply misused our sex in your love prate. Put that, let's update that to the 21st century. You have set women's rights back 300 years. We must have your doublet and hose plucked over your head and show the world what the bird had done to her own nest. We've got to strip you of your clothes to show the world what you, woman, have done to your own nest means to all womankind. Shh. Cuz, 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 my pretty little cuz, that thou didst know how many fathom deep I am in love. It cannot be sounded. My affection hath an unknown bottom like the Bay of Portugal. I am so crazy about Orlando. I will say anything. Or rather bottomless. Okay. And so they talk about Venus and such. 4-2. Um, actually, we'll skip 4-2. 4-3. Rosaline and Celia come back in. And what's happened? Well, two hours have gone by. And it's after 2 o'clock. Orlando's not there. How say you now? Is it not past two o'clock? And here much, Orlando? With pure love and troubled brain, he attained his bow and arrows and has gone forth to sleep. He doesn't really love you. But Sylvius comes in with the letter and he gives it to Rosaline. Letters from Phoebe. She examines the letter. And they talk back and forth, and she reads the letter. And we're told, towards the uh, left-hand column on the next page, line 60, I don't know, 64, 65 or so. Sylvia says, call you this chiding? Oh, Celia, alas, poor shepherd. Rosaline, do you pity him? That is, do you pity Sylvius? No, he deserves no pity. Why? Wilt thou love such a woman? He doesn't deserve pity because he's being a fool for loving Phoebe. What? To make thee an instrument and play false strains upon me? There's another image Shakespeare likes. He's going to use that same image in Hamlet. He's going to have Hamlet address his two friends and say, you know, you think you can play me like this recorder here, okay? So, to make thee an instrument play false strains upon thee, not to be endured, go your way to her, for I see love hath made thee a tame snake. And say this, if she love me, I charge her to love thee. So she loves me, I'm commanding her to love you. So if she really loves Ganymede, what will Phoebe do? She'll love Silvius. If she will not, I will never have her unless thou entreat for her. If you be a true lover, go. Here comes more company. Okay, Oliver comes in. And they talk. Page nine, uh, line 92. Now, when did we last see Oliver? He was getting ready to leave the court, right? He had commanded, um, he had commanded, no, the Duke had commanded him to leave and bring back Orlando within 12 months. Or, lose everything and be banished himself. So he's in the forest now. And we're, pulled, we're told, line 92, Orlando doth commend him to you both, and to that youth he calls his Rosaline, he sends this bloody napkin. 
are you he? Now, when he says, are you he, he's looking at Celia. And Rosaline says, I'm over here, I am he. So, a bloody napkin. What does this mean? Some of my shame, if you will know of me, what man I am, and how and why, and where this hand So, I got to tell you a little bit about myself. Go on. When last the young Orlando parted from you, he left a promise to return again. Within an hour, and pacing through the forest, chewing the food of sweet and bitter fancy, lo, what befell. That is, chewing the food of sweet and bitter fancy, fantasy, as he left, he was kind of in a reverie of, so of sorts. And what happened? He threw his eye aside, that is, he looked askance, and marked what object did present itself. Under an old oak whose boughs were mossed with age, and high top bald with dry antiquity, a wretched ragged man overgrown with hair lay sleeping on his back. And around his neck, a green and gilded snake had wreathed itself. We're meant to assume that by the gilding, this is some kind of poisonous snake. Um, who with her head, nimble and threats, approached the opening of its mouth. So he's asleep, sleeping with his mouth open, and the snake's getting ready. But suddenly, seeing Orlando, it unlinked itself, and with indented glides did slip away into a bush, under which bush's shade a lioness, with udders all drawn dry, lay couching head on ground with cat-like watch, when that the sleeping man should stir. So, first there's a snake that's about to kill him, but also nearby is a, the, the udders dry, the um, dry nipples of the cow, are meant, of uh, the lion, are meant to imply this thing's starving. And there's the meat. The royal disposition of that beast to prey on nothing that does seem as dead. That is, lions aren't scavengers. They kill their meat. Well, we know they are. I mean, they'll steal other preys, uh, other hunters dead. This scene, Orlando did approach the man and found it was his brother, his elder brother. Celia, oh, I've heard of him. I've heard of him speak of him. Notice what this tells us. Celia and Rosaline probably don't know Oliver, or they've not seen him much. So he says, or excuse me, Celia says, he did render him the most unnatural that lived amongst men. That is, Oliver was the most unnatural. Why? What's meant by unnatural? Against nature. Against humanity. Right? Because that's the nature of, of Orlando. It's the nature of all of them. They're human males. Okay? What else is it? So it's against nature. How does how is Oliver against nature? Well, how does he treat his youngest brother? Orlando. How did Oliver treat Orlando? Poorly. Poorly. He didn't want him to live. What were we told? The night Orlando fled, Oliver was going to do what? Burn the place where he lived with him inside it. Right? So... Unnatural is against nature, against kind. Kind is related to the word genus, you know, the, the nature of a thing. But it also has that other, you know, meaning of nice. He, he violates all these kinds of norms. Oliver, <laughs> and well he might also. And well he might so do, for well I know he was unnatural. Back to Orlando. Why is he late? Because what's Rosaline thinking? Orlando, bloody napkin. Did he leave him there? Food to the sucked and hungry. So did Orlando let his brother be eaten? Twice did he turn his back and purposed so. He saw his brother. He saw the lion and said, the hell with him. And twice turned and left. But kindness. Kindness means both niceness and naturalness according to nature, according to one's species. 
nobler ever than revenge, and nature, stronger than his just occasion, made him give battle to the lioness. So it's both nature and nurture kind of thing working together. It's not just the raw physicality of what he is. It's also this idea of nobility in Orlando. Who quickly fell before him, in which hurling from miserable slumber, I awaked. And now Oliver tells us, the speaker tells us who he is. I am that elder brother who was asleep and nearly killed by the snake and the lion. Are you his brother? Was it you he rescued? Was it you that did so oft contrive to kill him? Yeah, we've heard. Twas I, but tis not I. Another thing Shakespeare loves to do. Immediately juxtapose that was me that is not me. Emphasizing what? Change. Person is change. Something has happened instantaneously. I do not shame to tell you what I was since my conversion. That is a very loaded term. Not as loaded in Shakespeare's day. You know, in terms of religion, religious conversion. So sweetly tastes being the thing I am. That is, since my conversion... I do not shame to tell you what I was. It's the old Adam idea. This was the old me. This was the unrepentant me, the unconverted me. But now I've changed. Now I'm converted. Now this is the new Adam at work in me. Uh, bloody napkin, come on, get to the point. She wants to know, is Orlando dead? When from the first to last betwixt this two, tears our recountments had mostly kindly bathed. That's how I came into that desert place. In brief, he led me to the gentle duke and gave me fresh array and entertainment, committing me unto my brother's love, meaning my brother's keeping. Am I my brother's keeper? Yes. <laughs> Who led me instantly into his cave, stripped himself, and here upon his arm the lioness had torn some flesh away which he bled, and now he fainted and cried, and fainting, Rosaline, Rosaline. And so he's got to go find Rosaline. Okay? So he sent me hither, stranger as I am, to tell the story, that you might excuse his broken promise. So, he's not here, why? Because he's wounded, and he saved my life. Good enough reason for him to be late? Why, how now, Ganymede, sweet Ganymede? What are you going to do now? Many will swoon when they do look on blood. Why is Rosalind has swooned? Oliver's saying, yeah, there's a lot of men who can't take blood. Because she's supposed to be a man. There is more in it. No, no, there's a lot more than that. Okay, so they help her up. Oliver. Be of good cheer, youth. You lack a man's heart. I do so. I confess it. Got me. This was not counterfeit. That is, no, 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 no. You're not faking it. Counterfeit, I assure you. I was just, take a good heart and counterfeit to be a man. Take a good heart. Well, what is a conversion? It's a replacing of a bad heart with a good heart. David says in Psalm 51, Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit in me. That is, take the bad, restore with a new one. Okay? So, she says, so I do. That is, I take a good heart, and I will counterfeit to be a man. <laughs> That's what she'd been doing. But in faith, I should have been born a woman by right. It's kind of saying, but this is what happens when I see blood. You know. So, 5-1. Touchstone comes in with Audrey. Uh, we're going to skip 5-1. 5-2. Orlando comes in, his arm in a sling, and Oliver. And Orlando says, really? 
You talked to her for only a few minutes. You like her? That but saying you should love her, not Rosaline Celia. I mean, he talked to her for what? Five minutes? And yet, what did Phoebe say upon meeting Ganymede? Love at first sight. Neither call the giddiness of it in question line five. The poverty of her, the small acquaintance, the poverty of her, her poorness, small acquaintance, the little bit of time we met, my sudden wooing, nor her sudden consenting, but say with me, I love Eliana. That is, between the end of Act 4 and the beginning of Act 5, Scene 2, Oliver and Celia have wooed. And she's already said, yes. Say with her that she loves me. Consent with both. He's asking for his little brother's consent. His youngest brother's consent. That's not how it works in English society in this day. If Shakespeare's little brother, after his father died, um, wanted to be married, he would have to get Shakespeare's approval. Why? Because he's now the head. Of the house, even if the little brother was like 22, you'd have to get his brother's approval for that. Okay, so Shakespeare's flipping that. Why? Oliver's a new man in this conversion. What essentially kind of happens, what had been the hierarchy gets even out. He's asking his brother out of love, out of respect, out of admiration for his brother. And he says, consent with her, and it shall be to your good. Here's how it will be to your good. For my father's house and all the revenue that was old Sir Roland's will I estate upon you. And here live and die a shepherd. You get it all. There is a middle brother. Hopefully he gets some. Okay? He's saying, I'm going to stay here with Eliana and die a shepherd. What shepherd? Why is he giving up the court? What's he found here? New life. That's the conversion. And there's probably the religious, definitely the religious idea of conversion as well. Of course, you have my consent. Let your wedding be tomorrow. Thither will I invite the Duke and all his contented followers. Go, you prepare, Eliana, for look you, here comes my Rosaline. Okay, so they come in. And she says, I thought thy heart had been wounded with the claws of a lion. <laughs> it is wounded, but not a lion. Okay, for your brother and my sister, line 31, no sooner met, but they looked, no sooner looked, but they loved, no sooner loved, but they sighed, no sooner sighed, but they asked one another reason, no sooner knew the reason, but they sought the remedy. And in these degrees have they made a pair of stairs to marriage, which they will climb incontinent or else be incontinent before marriage. That is, they better get married fast. Why? Because they can't wait. They are in the very wrath of love, and they will together. That is, they desire to be together. Tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow will be soon enough. They can hold off one night. She says, um, I, tomorrow I can't serve your turn for Rosalind. We, we can't keep playing our game. I can live no longer by thinking. No, no, I need the real Rosalind. Okay. I will weary you then no longer with idle talking. Know of me then. For now I seek to so, speak to some purpose. And we're gonna we'll have to spend just a few minutes probably on next Thursday. Know of me then, for now I speak to some purpose. That is, I have a goal and I speak to some ultimate conclusion. Purpose here meaning having an end. All will be explained. That I know you are a gentleman of good conceit. I speak not this that you should bear a good opinion of my knowledge, insomuch 
I say, I know you are. Neither do I labor for a greater esteem. That is, I'm not asking you to think better of me than may in some little measure draw a belief from you to do yourself good and not to grace me. Believe them, if you please. I can do strange things. Kind of implied, I can bend nature. I can do strange things. I have, since I was three years old, conversed with a magician most profound in his art, and yet not damnable. So what kind of magician who can be profound in his art and yet not be damnable? It's not black magic. This is white magic. This is good magic. We'll see. No, we're not doing it. We would see something very similar in The Winter's Tale. Right? So, she says, if you, dove ro do if you do love Rosaline so near the heart as your gesture cries it out, when your brother marries Aliana, shall you marry her? He probably goes, how are you, you going to work that out? She's not even here. I know into what straits of fortune she is driven. And it is not impossible to me, if it appear not inconvenient to her, to you, to set her before your eyes tomorrow, human as she is, and without any danger. Tomorrow, if you really want to marry her, I can make that happen. Speaks thou and sober, seriously, really? By my life I do, which I tender dearly, though I say I am a magician. Put you in your best array, bid your friends, for if you will be married tomorrow, you shall, and to Rosaline, if you will, if that's what you desire. Okay? Phoebe and Sylvia has come in. What happens? Phoebe wants to marry Ganymede, correct? Yes. Sylvia wants to marry Phoebe. So, Audrey, they get married, so they might not. So, Silvius loves Phoebe. Phoebe loves Ganymede. Orlando loves Rosaline. Rosaline pretends to be Ganymede, who pretends to be Rosaline, fall back. You got all this weird stuff going on. Okay? So Rosaline as Ganymede tells Phoebe, I can never marry a woman. She's like, what? <laughs> um Silvius says, I am made for Gan I am made for Phoebe. Phoebe says, I am made for Ganymede. This is line 87 or so. Ros uh, Orlando says, I for Rosaline, Rosaline, and I for no woman. Now it could just mean eunuch, could just mean asexual, has no sexual desire and such. Silvius, it is to be all made of fantasy, all made of passion, all made of wishes, all adoration, duty, and observance, all humanness, all patience and impatience. All purity, all trial, all observance, and so I am for Phoebe. This is what Silvius means love is. Phoebe hears that. She says, yep, and I have that for Ganymede, Orlando, and I for Rosaline, Rosaline, and I for no woman. So, Rosaline concludes. Stop. Pray you no more of this. To Silvius, I will help you if I can. To Phoebe, I would love you if I could. Tomorrow, meet me all together. To Phoebe, I will marry you if ever I marry woman, and I'll be married tomorrow. And Phoebe's thinking, yes. I will marry you if ever I marry woman, and tomorrow I'm getting married. Logic says, man, woman, going to marry me. I will satisfy you if ever I satisfied man, and you shall be married tomorrow. Well, the only way Orlando's going to be satisfied is if he marries Rosaline. But Ganymede isn't Rosaline, so how can he set up? It, it could be some homosexual thing. I don't think so. Silvius, I will content you. What Silvius want more than anything? Phoebe, you will have your content, your heart's desire. If what pleases you contents you, and you shall be married tomorrow. As you love Rosaline, meet, she says to Orlando. To Silvius, as you love Phoebe, meet. And as I love no woman... I'll meet. Okay. Touchstone Audrey come in five three. Yeah, we got three minutes. Yeah, we don't have enough time. Um, yeah, we don't have enough time to even start five four. So we'll stop there. So
So, uh, shoot, I have to decide. Yeah, I hate to do it. I think I'm going to have to drop uh, Merchant of Venice. Um, and it, it's because we're one day behind now. Uh, I think we're one day behind. And I've only given two days for each of the last two plays. And it's taking us no time. Uh, I do have three days at least. I have three days for both Hamlet and Lear. That'll that'll work. That won't be a problem. Two longest plays. Um, so for next week, for Thursday, what's the next thing on the show? <laughs> yeah, other than merchant. That's that's uh, Hamlet. Yeah, so for next Thursday, because we don't have class on Tuesday, start Hamlet. Acts 1 and 2. And I will have your exams, and if I don't have your exams, you won't have your exam until you get your first exam back. 